uh, July 11, 2011 meeting of the Town Council to order. Uh, would the clerk please take the roll? Council Chair Sherman? Here. Council Gouvernelli? Here. Council Jordan? Here. Councilor Lennon? Councilor Sullivan? Here. Councilor Swift Kayata? Here. And Councilor Walsh? Here. Uh, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, town Council reports and correspondence. Jessica. Yes, um, I'd like to um, let everyone know that starting tomorrow evening, there's going to be a free concert on the library lawn. Tomorrow, Tuesday, 6.30 p.m., the, group, the band Tricky Britches will be playing blues music. On Tuesday the 26th, Belfast Brogue will be playing Irish pub music. On Tuesday, August 9, Bluesberry Jam will be playing jazz. This is being uh, uh, supported by the Thomas Memorial Library Foundation. And uh, so I hope you'll all have a chance to, to go. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Anyone else? I just want to state the obvious. This is a great time to be living in the town of Cape Elizabeth. The strawberries are in season. Uh, we have the Beach to Beacon right around the corner. If you are up uh, early or really almost any time of day, you see all kinds of uh, people out training, including uh, the likes of me. I don't plan to have a personal best this year, but I do plan to participate. And it's uh, uh, a great time for our town. I did ask the town clerk very briefly if she could give an update on the upcoming election to fill Cynthia Dill's seat to the State House of Representatives. Uh, Deborah? Thank you very much. The election will be held on Tuesday, August 16th. The election will be held in the high school ca um, cafeteria, not the gym. The gym is under construction with new bleachers, so we will be in the cafeteria. Uh, and please remember that it's only District 121. We've had a few District 123 folks request absentee ballots and, and it's just for District 121. So absentee ballot request you can make now. Um, the ballots will be in probably about a week or so. We don't have them today. It was just the deadline uh, to submit papers to the state and so forth. So we will have those within a few days. And again, if you can come to the election, that would be great Tuesday, August 16th. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Deborah. Uh, this is the first opportunity this evening for citizens to discuss items that are not on the agenda. If anybody would like to speak on an item that's not on tonight's agenda, please come to the podium, identify yourself, and we'd be happy to hear from you. Okay, seeing none, I'll ask uh, the town manager for his report. Yes, uh, thanks, David. I just wanted to make note uh, of the passing this past month of Bill Wadman. Uh, Bill was uh, elected to the town council as, as the first individual who wasn't on the initial council after we moved to the, the council manager form of government. Uh, he, he took Gordon Davis's place on the council. Who, uh, Gordon was one of the, the, the first counselors. Bill, I, I noticed some of the folks here were also at his uh, service the other day. Uh, just, he was just a, a wonderful, wonderful person, uh, committed to uh, public service in every way. And you know, it, it's tough to pick out the unique things he did, but when, at his very first council meeting, he was one of the ones that voted to approve the plans of Cape Elizabeth High School, to give you a sense of you know, some of the, the significant things. In 1970, there, was, there had been a lot of debate about Fort Williams and what to do with it, and there had been an urban renewal authority that had presented a mixed-use development plan for Fort Williams uh, that was going to be part offices, part, uh, part park, uh, part educational uses, a whole mix of things, really a lot different from what we see there today, you know, a lot of building and construction. And anyway, it was rejected by a four to three vote, and Bill was one of those who was in the majority that decided that development wasn't the, the right thing for Fort Williams Park. Uh, subsequent to that, there was a key council vote in 1976 that determined that Fort Williams would be predominantly park. And although that vote was unanimous, again, Bill was someone who was really looking after the, the future interests of uh, Fort Williams. When, when he was on the council, he worked with uh, Ed Woodsum and a couple of other councils, and really, you know, it, 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 you know, with some of the discussion we're going to have later on tonight, he was really one of the, the, the first leaders in Cape Elizabeth at looking at, at preserving open space. Uh, he, he worked, I see Frank Strout here, he worked with uh, Frank's father and, and uh, uh, 
again, Ed Woodson, Peter Rand, uh, Nat Clifford, and they, they were some of the founders of the Cape Elizabeth Conservation Commission that initially began to preserve land and save land. When Bill was chair of the town council, one of the actions that, that particular year was for the town to accept uh, Lions Field from the Lions and to make it into a town park. Uh, he also was a founder of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust, uh, again, along with some of those other individuals I, I mentioned earlier, and served on their board for many years in their advisory council. When, when Jan Soland and Ellen Van Fleet uh, set up the Cape Courier as a not-for-profit newspaper, they asked Bill to be the uh, town council, uh, excuse me, not the town council, they asked him, this was a private citizen at that point, they asked him to be the board chairman of the Cape Courier, so he was the first board chair of the Cape, uh, Cape Courier. He, he also, when town was first looking at getting cable TV, uh, he was the council's point person, the key person. Uh, on that, I, I see Chuck Wilson in the back there. When Chuck was appointed fire chief, he was one of the ones that supported uh, Chuck to be to be the fire chief. Uh, you know, there, there were so many things he did. He was a he was a he was a great toastmaster. Uh, if there were, when we had a town event, you know, when Joni Benoit first won the Olympic gold marathon, I think everyone tends to remember when the sculpture was dedicated. But before that, there was an event at Cape Elizabeth High School, and he, he I think I believe he was the master of ceremonies for that. Always, always a person who tried to bring people together. Always, always a person who, who really, I think, had a, a long-term view of, of the future. And you know, the, the meetings back then always used to go until about 11 or midnight. And, uh, there were a lot of it. They, they met twice a month regularly. And you know, it's it's you know those individuals who served on the council that I think you know really helped to make the Cape Elizabeth today and and build it so much. Not only you know through his official positions, he was. We ended up after the council service served as both library trustee and conservation commission in addition to his council work. You know, he did so many other things in the community and was always looked toward for leadership. And uh, Norma, his, uh, Norma, his wife of I think about 60 years, uh, uh, is, is here in town. He also has family in the area. And just uh, a person who gave so much to the community. And I didn't thank you. Uh, uh, David uh, didn't know him as well as I did. And David asked me to say a few words and thank you for that. And, uh, Bill was, you know, truly a great gentleman and, and a real honor to know. Thank, thank you, Mike. Other than the meetings going till 11 o'clock at night, I think we all on the council can aspire to the service uh, to have the, uh, serve the community the way that Mr. Wadman did. It really is remarkable. Um, tonight we have, as the first item on the agenda, we have two representatives of an organization uh, known as Smart Meter Safety Coalition. We have Diane Wilkins and Sue Foley Ferguson is at the podium as I speak. Uh, they were among the appellants who uh, appeared before the public, Maine Public Utilities Commission regarding smart meters and they asked for an opportunity to speak tonight uh, to update uh, people in the town of Cape Elizabeth regarding smart meters and what uh, what the options are in terms of smart meters uh, at your home. And uh, we've asked them to limit their comments to 10 minutes. We have a, uh, a pretty full agenda tonight, and uh, we figured 10 minutes would be about the right balance. So without further ado, uh, Sue, if you would. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. Thank you for allowing us this time, and um, also for your resolution a while back before um, we spent the last eight months at the PUC um, fighting our case for opt-outs to the smart meter program. Um, we have put together some information here that we think is important for your residents to know about smart meters and about the program. And each one of these slides could take about 45 minutes. So, and I'm a big talker, but I'm going to really whip through it fast. But if you have any questions at the end, we have all, we have all of our sources. We have a big packet with information and uh, we are the members of the Smart Meter Safety uh, Coalition. Elisa Boxer-Cook is also here. She, she's the founding member and was the first complainant for the US, uh, PUC. There were seven complainants uh, total, seven complaints at the Public Utilities Commission, and five of those were consolidated. They did not address privacy or health issues at the Public Utilities Commission. The only item they addressed were opt-outs. After eight months of our testimony, uh, the PUC ruled that it was unreasonable to force customers to accept a wireless meter and that it was in the public interest to allow any customer who wanted to to opt out. So what we've got now is two opt-out options. We have an electromechanical meter, which they're calling 
CMP is calling option B. For $40 fee and $12 a month, you can keep your existing meter. Um, these numbers, it's a long, long story how these numbers came to be, so we're not going there at all. But um, the wireless smart meter is option A, the one that they prefer, but the one we don't really prefer. It's a one-way communication. It still has two wireless antennas on it, and it can be turned on remotely. CMP can turn on. Your, your um, town, I think, has already been deployed, and so you will not be getting notified, we found out, regarding opt-out options. We thought you would be last year, or last week we clarified that you, you will not be notified. So your residents need to know that if they should decide to opt out, they're going to have to, the onus is on them to contact CMP. Um, that was a technicality in the order. Most people have the 30 days to respond. That's what that there is for. So what are the differences between the two meters? The opt out, um, the electromechanical meter is hardwired. The smart meter turned off, is a, it's still wireless, it's still two antenna. CMP can remotely connect and disconnect the, the uh, smart meter that's turned off. They still have to come on site to connect and disconnect your existing meter. It's exactly the same as your existing, the existing program, except they aren't going to read it um, every month. They're going to read it every third month, and you're going to have estimated bills on the electromechanical meter. That's because they laid off 130 people, and they're only going to be hiring uh, one or two per county um, to cover the existing meters. There, there are now 9,000 people that have opted out, um, but that was prior to the PUC determining that it was going to cost. So we're not really sure whether that number is going to hold or not. So anyway, back to the comparisons. Um, the, exist the electromechanical meter is the existing meter. The smart meter turned off is not even created yet. It's to be developed with $900,000 of the taxpayers' dollars. And that was another sort of bone of a contention. But if you want that option, you can still check that box and say you want that option. But it won't be a while until you have it. Um, they said up to nine months to a year. Um, it, the electromechanical meter will not communicate with your appliances, and the wireless will connect to your appliances. I'm going to zip really quickly through the radio frequency mesh system. You guys, for those of you who have never seen this, I could spend a real long time explaining how the whole infrastructure works. Suffice it to say that your meter is an antenna that receives and transmits data, and that your data is transferred from house to house to house to house to, to a collector. That collector may be another person's house. That up to 15,000 uh, transmissions per day in a collector home could be felt. And the, the uh, repeaters and the gateways that collect the wireless data from your homes are really, they amount to miniature cell phone towers. And as some people are aware, there is major debate about siting homes and things to, to cell towers, yet here we are allowing Central Maine Power to do so. The other thing people don't realize is that all of the new appliance, you have to have new appliances, you have to buy new appliances in order to use the system the way you want. And all of them will be equipped with wireless RF chips. And those chips will communicate with their home area network, which is going to at least cost you $450. And then, um, you, it, it's true that you can go online right away and get your general usage data, but you can do that now. Um, so you're going to need to purchase all these things if you want to use your smart meter. And this appliances will be equipped later to recognize and react uh, from signals, or react to signals from the utility, for instance, if the load is high. So the theory is conservation. As you, most of the people, I'm glad my friends are all here, they know I'm conservation oriented. And um, it's perplexed me why we've all sort of jumped on this bandwagon, because there's there's, the data does not show that consumers are going to be using this system. Um, so anyway, each home equipped with a wireless mesh, up to 15,000 transmissions per day. The peak pulses, despite what you hear in the media, are 100 times stronger than cell phones. And let me tell you why. Because what they do is they <coughs> time average it. For cell phones, where you've got your cell phone up to your ear, um, the FCC limits are talking about what, what is that... Um, power. 
for, for the power that they're talking about with smart meters, they time average it. So if there was one big strong burst one time a day, they average it over 24 hours. And what do you have? It looks like they're very small amount of pulses, but that's not exactly true. Um, the other thing that the wireless appliances that are connected to your meter, they will collect very detailed hourly data. The data will be hourly, and the um, wireless meter that if you opt out with the, the wireless turned off, you will still, your data will still be collected by CMP on that. Every third month, they will come and they will download the information from your home um, to, uh, to, to store for their, into their database, I guess. Um, so it, it, this would, these wireless appliances that are connected are going to enable the consumer, this is, this is the reason why they, you know, they're pushing this for, it allows the consumer and the utility to control the fl flow uh, of energy to individual appliances and eventually from your cell phones and from your computers. The problem is that the FCC standards don't encompass uh, cumulative effects of RF. They only do cell phones on a 180 pound man six inches from your ear. And there's a lot more concerns, of, uh, health concerns about RF radiation than just cell phones. Uh, I have my cell phone, I love technology. Look, I'm doing a smart <laughs> presentation. Um, so smart choices, why do you want to opt out? Um, these, we put together what we think are the, the the biggest issues. I'm going to run through them real quickly. Um, radio frequency interference. There wasn't a, a complaint right here from Cape Elizabeth behind the school. Um, one of the complaints at the PUC, they can no longer use their Netflix. I don't know if you know that, if any of you counselors have heard this, but the neighborhood behind the school is having major issues with Netflix. And the person who put the complaint in um, says he can do his Netflix in his bedroom, but not into his kitchen, and he already opted out. So the, the problem he's having is with his neighbor's smart meter. Radio frequency interference um, with Wi-Fi, Netflix, security systems, computers, medical devices, and most people, if people have pacemakers and um, deep brain stimulators, especially the older models where they don't, there can be a danger. Um, some of the doctors, the, People's doctors tell them to stay away from wireless, stay away from microwaves. There's our been a you, you time. Have, uh, what uh, one minute. Oh my God. Uh, just whip. See? Oh, okay. But this, so, just to be clear, this is all available on the town's website, this, this PowerPoint. Okay. Mic. Okay. Right? Wow. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I didn't go fast enough, did I? Sorry. Data collection. Uh, I'm just going to whip through then. Hourly usage data, the kind of information that they will be able to tell you. Is it? really a profile of your daily living um, and a lot of people feel it's unwarranted surveillance and then speaking of sort of unwarranted surveillance people are, are concerned because wireless is way more hackable um, and more vulnerable to attacks the electric grid and the banking and transportation in particular and then there's also been fire safety issues and overbilling um, and inaccurate the health concerns are short-term and long-term um, we have sources for all of these. Um, it changes your biology. Uh, the FCC standards don't exist for non-thermal radiation, and the World Health Organization recently classified radio frequency radiation as a possible carcinogen. So that's in the same category as lead, engine exhaust, and DDT. And then these are some of our sources. And so those are your choices. Why opt out? Health, safety, security, and privacy, your choice. We are, we're available for if anybody wants to have a longer forum, because we have so much information to share. But thank you. Do you have a uh, website? We do have a website. The website is www.smartmetersafety.com. And if anybody has any questions, you can email uh, any of the complainants. And we've been fielding a lot of questions. And there's a links to email addresses on the website? Uh, is there links to email addresses? On Yours is on there. Our, mine's on okay. there. Okay. No, I, I don't want mine on there. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah, uh, there is a lot of information on the website and elaboration on all of these various issues. But we did just run one way to awareness. So the things that are cropping up when the smart meters get. Yeah, so I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm so talkative. That's, no, you actually did an, uh, a 
fine job getting through it, and I took up a little of your time, but this presentation is available on the town's website for those who are interested in reviewing it. Frank. Just one comment. You indicated that we would not be given, uh, be notified of the opt-out option, but I actually received a card from CMP. Oh, you did? Yes. Uh, That's good. Last week, so I don't know if anyone else has. Oh, good. That's an good. Did you request an op to opt out? Oh, you would. Originally. Oh, that you, you will. If you originally request, I, I, I should have made that clear. If you originally requested to opt out, you will get notified. If you did not request to opt out, you won't get notified, and you're going to have to be, because you've already been deployed. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Uh, the next item on our agenda is to review and approve the minutes from our June 13, 2011 meeting. Is there a motion? I'm so moved. And just, okay, the motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, the next item is number 102-2011, uh, which is on the agenda tonight. Uh, this is a request for reconsideration of this item from our June meeting relating to the uh, proposed partnership with a land trust for the acquisition of property that we're referring to as Robinson Woods 2. Uh, normally, uh, our town council rules allow for public comment once I've introduced the agenda item. So this would be the time now that I'll, in a few minutes anyway, that I'll ask people to come up and speak at the podium. It is possible that after the public comment period ends that there may not be a motion to reconsider, uh, which would be a bit odd to invite public comment on an agenda item that then doesn't become a motion. Uh, but I'm going to do my best to adhere to the town council rules. I anticipate we will have a motion to reconsider. So uh, since people know what the issues are, I'll invite the public uh, to come up to the podium and speak. Uh, this is not advertised as a public hearing, so our rules allow for 15 minutes total of public comment. Uh, however, the town council does have some latitude, depending on the circumstances and interest, to uh, alter that rule uh, if the circumstances merit. So we will, uh, for now, open it up for the public to come speak. Please identify yourself. You would be limited to three minutes, uh, and we welcome your comments. Yes, and if you would, just line up so we can try to not uh, waste any of our 15 minutes on uh, people walking to the podium. Uh, my name is Richard Berman. I live at 58 Hannafin Cove Road. And um, I read this article, and that's what got me here uh, today. I'm very much against using public money, 350000 to support this uh, purchase. Um, we are already supporting this. When, um, Mr. when the Robinson Trust donates land to the land trust, it comes off the tax roll. Uh, so we as a public really pick up those taxes we've lost. So we are supporting this already. Um, <clears throat> I respect, by the way, I respect the land trust um, in their decision to sort of uh, support the wishes of the Robinson families in their position to support anybody who gives them land. If they put restrictions on it, the land trust has an obligation to support that. But it also raises the point that <clears throat> that isn't always in the public's interest. That's in the landowner's interest who uh, gives them the land. I don't know, I was on the land trust as a, one of their trustees around, I don't know, a dozen years ago or so. And we used to have these philosophical conversations. And I remember specifically, um, there was somebody who offered to donate to the land trust, the land trust, but they didn't want public access. And there were a few of us then on the board who said, wait a minute, if it comes off the tax roll, it's got to have a public purpose, it's got to serve the public. And I was told, uh, that no, we don't serve the public, we serve those wealthy people who give us land. I left the land trust after that, as well as a few others. There is this philosophical um, challenge in the land trust. I respect their decision to support those people who give them land. I don't support public money going into the land trust to support just people who want quiet contemplation and reverence for the natural world. I'd rather see older people who want a shovel pathway to be able to use, kids who want to get to the school. I think it's 
ridiculous to give them money only to, and, and to pay $100,000 extra um, in that section of the things because they won't, because they can't actually uh, let us do that. I would much rather have the $350,000 that you know, we're contemplating, put 100000 into the sure way path, that, because that's how much extra we're going to have to pay because we can't use the Robinson land, and then give the other 250000 to our Conservation Commission that we do control, that does serve the public, all the public's interest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Sherman. My name is Ted Darling. I live at 35 Macaulay Road, and I'm the board president for the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. Last month, the town council unanimously approved a pledge of $350,000 to support the land trust purchase of Robinson Woods II, and acknowledged, acknowledged as the number one land conservation priority for both the town and the land trust. The pledge included an addendum that the land trust conduct a respectful discussion with the town on allowing part of the Shore Road pathway to cross the Robinson Woods property. As affirmed by the town manager in last month's meeting, the addendum was not binding on the pledge and did not require the land trust reverse its 2009 decision regarding the Shore Road path. We greatly appreciated the town's pledge for Robinson Woods too, and we welcomed the opportunities to speak to town council about our decision on the Shore Road path. Since that meeting, land trust representatives have met with town representatives formally on two occasions, including a council workshop on June 30th. Importantly, Council Chairman Dave Sherman has characterized each of those discussions as respectful. During our meetings, we explained the process and the rationale for the land trust decision regarding the Shore Road path. From September 2008 through April 2009, our board evaluated the merits of the Shore Road Path proposal in the context of the conservation easement, which governs the appropriate use of Robinson Woods One property. We discussed the Shore Road Path formally as a board on seven occasions before reaching a unanimous decision that the Shore Road Path was not an appropriate use of the Robinson Woods Preserve. We provided a written decision to town management on May 9, 2009. Up until now, council has never formally questioned our Shore Road Path decision. Indeed, the town sought and received 729000 of Maine Department of Transportation funding for the Shore Road Path, a five-foot wide paved walk walkway almost entirely in the public right-of-way and which runs from Fort Williams to Town Center. Were the time to go back to MDOT now and ask for a variation in the path plan for an unpaved trail to go through Robinson Woods 1, it is far from certain that this variance would be approved. In fact, our MD MDOT sources tell us that they require pavement and they prefer the public right of way. What is disheartening is that what began as a non-binding addendum for a respectful discussion between the land trust and the town has now become a not so subtle demand by some councillors that the land trust allow the shore road path on Robinson Woods 1 as a prerequisite for funding Robinson Woods 2, an entirely separate project. Given these circumstances, there's absolutely no way the land trust could reverse this decision on the Shore Road path or we'd destroy our credibility as an independent land conservation organization. Further, we're concerned that a reversal of the June 13th motion now might not only result in the loss of funding for the town's number one land conservation priority, but it may also result in the loss of MDOT funding for the Shore Road path, clearly a lose-lose scenario. Ted, if you could accordingly, we res re respectfully urge council to deny the motion to reconsider. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. My name is Robert Barton. I live at Eight Woods Knoll Drive, and I'm really not tuned into all of the little uh, nuances of this thing and the uh, technical uh, aspects of it. But my comments are more philosophical which I thought might be worth uh, passing along. Uh, I agree pretty much with uh, everything that Dick Berman said and many of the things that he said were things that I was also thinking would be worth uh, saying. I think the, uh, the land trust has a, uh, has a wonderful role here in the Cape and, uh, and they do a real good job. And uh, I can't imagine any, anybody not being in support of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. I know we have, although we haven't been major, but we have been in support of their mission and have uh, provided some support. On the other hand, they have a certain kind of mission, and then the town has a kind of a mission. 
And I think the mission, in, in this combined effort to, uh, to provide some funding to help seed the purchase of uh, Robinson Woods Roman Oval II, um, I think we're losing sight of the town's primary mission. I mean, it's kind of easy for folks to get cranked up and say, oh, this is a wonderful thing, let's do it. But it's not one of those things where we have to do it. You know, we don't have to plow the roads. We don't have to buy that new school boiler. We don't have to buy that new road grader. All of those kinds of things are things that we really need to do, where we need to maintain our municipal uh, staff and people and our teachers. And we wrestle with school budgets and all that sort of stuff. And it just strikes me that this whole idea of the town sort of voting to come up with $350,000, a third of a million dollars, and then go out and borrow most of that for the purpose of supplementing something that the land trust is doing is not right. I mean, I think, I think their mission is great, and I think we should all support it, and I think they should have an effort to, uh, to raise the funds, and as many of us as we can get behind it and support it. But I think uh, it's wrong for us to do that. Having said that, and now that everything is uh, where it is, I guess I would hope that maybe there was a way that we could convince the land trust to cooperate and help us rejigger the pathway so that that could be done, some money could be saved, and trees could be saved, and all that sort of stuff. But it was a philosophical difference that I wanted to share. Thank you. Julian Coles, Two Autumn Tides Lane, longtime Cape Elizabeth resident. I don't normally arrive here to say hello and see the great work you guys are doing, gals doing, but this one uh, struck a chord with me um, in two respects. One, uh, I think we should all be extremely proud of the town's effort to preserve open space and the great job that Cape Elizabeth Land Trust has done. What upset me and what, what made me come this evening was I don't want to see these two organizations starting to pit one against the other. I don't think we can get where we want to go in terms of the overall quality of the effort that's going on out there if the land trust and the town start to fall out with each other. Um, there are plenty of other municipalities where the town not only supports the, the land trust in that town, but actually uh, provides funds for it to do its job. And I would just ask the council to live up to its obligation. I happen to be a fiscal conservative, and I don't want to get into that tonight, but they've made an obligation without strings. I think um, they should follow through on that, um, live with that decision, and also then work to figure out a way to get to a better place before it comes to a meeting like this. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Uh, Chris Franklin, Executive Director of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. Um, I think we have before us, as I've mentioned before, once in a lifetime opportunity to secure what is arguably one of the most important strategic conservation parcels in town. Um, 12 acres of fields, 5 acres of pond, 20 acres of waterfowl and western, wading bird habitat, and 70% of the, what's unprotected in the Crosstown Trail between Fort Williams and Kettle Cove, uh, mm -hmm. uh, issue that came up in 1974 to, to try to string together this network of trails. The promise of this project exemplifies the role of the land trust whose existence emanates from the town's own conservation commission, as Michael mentioned with Bill Wadman. Um, founded in 1985, we were formed to protect important lands with the recognition that the town could not prioritize the allocation or financial resources to do so entirely on its own. Our history is one of partnership with the town. We were born out of the town and we've always worked with the town. This cooperative relationship between the town and the land trust has led to the protection of remarkable natural areas, the trails around Great Pond, Hobstone Woods, protection of Jordan Farm, as well as the protection of Robinson Woods and Pond Cove. In addition to these properties, the town has partially supported CELTA's management responsibility on 21 additional parcels, including Trundy Point, Turkey Hill Farm, Dyer Hutchison, that we have preserved at no cost to the town all of which are managed for public benefit and the protection of natural resources. Previous town council actions complement these properties with the protection of the town farm property, Gullcrest, Winnick Woods, Fort Williams, Stonegate, and Cross Hill conservation areas. Town has also provided the bridge across the Spurwink Marsh and the Great Pond Boardwalk. 
The legacy of land protection of our two entities benefits local residents, both now and in the future. These projects also embody the goals and desires of local residents. They've repeatedly cited that the preservation of Cape Elizabeth's natural beauty, recreational trails, and natural resources is a top reason for not only living in Cape Elizabeth, but also as a top planning priority that they wish the town to implement. So I, I strongly feel that these, these projects <clears throat> are, are the desires of the, of the residents. It's unfortunate that SELT's desire to manage our properties in accordance with the conservation restrictions placed upon them has become a reason for some to consider itself uncooperative or unreasonable and to demand that we compromise our interpretation of our responsibilities. Given our mission and our history with the town, as I've outlined, there's simply no plausible reason for us to be uncooperative. That we have a working relationship, we work together on common goals, and there's really no incentive for us to stand in the way of, of Shore Road Path for any reason other than the mission of our organization, which is to protect the properties that are entrusted in our care. Chris, if you could wrap it up. Yep. Uh, we understand and appreciate that this council recognizes the importance of Robinson Woods too, and we urge you to recognize this opportunity to preserve one of Cape's great places. Thank you. Yes, sir. Bill Downs, 15 Old Colony Lane. Um, I log the council's efforts to try to work with the land trust to try to save money on another project. I also laud the land trust for adhering to its mission and being consistent with what it previously decided. However, I don't think the council should spend money to provide the purchase of parcels of land for an independent third party unless both the council and that third party are in total sync. If the town is going to spend money, the taxpayer's money, and go into debt to do it, then the town should participate in the negotiation of the terms and conditions so that the problem we have today doesn't exist going forward. I recommend that you revisit it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, members of the council, my name is Tony Armstrong. I live at 32 Lawson Road, Pont Oak Park neighborhood, which is adjacent to the property that's being discussed. And uh, as some of you know, I grew up in Pond Cove, and I live there now. I've been away for some time, but I started out there, and I'm there now. So I love the neighborhood, obviously, and love the surrounding natural resources. And I've given great thought over the years to a couple of related issues that I just want to bring up tonight, and they're very practical issues. I am not here tonight to debate what was already debated, that is, the town expenditures for the path and the town expenditures for Rubs and Woods uh, too. I think those issues have been decided by the council. But in terms of moving the path, I'd just like to make a couple of very practical suggestions. I, as I said, love that uh, line of roadway, but I think from a, from a practical standpoint, that curve is a very unsafe curve. And I think all of us remember uh, about three years ago, a young lady from this town died in a tragic car accident uh, on the curve which, of which this is part of the S curve right in front of that curve, the car went off the road. Secondly, I have some concerns about folks, you know, walking this path at night and all of a sudden, if they don't know much about the path, or even if they do, finding themselves, you know, at dusk, all of a sudden in the deep, dark wood. And, you know, for, even if only for a few hundred yards. Um, and I have some other concerns about just, you know, just who will find this a convenient place to, to hang out in the evening. Uh, I just think, uh, you know, the, the path was designed to be on the road frontage. We all agreed that that curb was going to have to be altered. So I think from a safety standpoint, uh, we're all better off having things stay the way they are. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. We've actually gone just about 15 minutes. So at, at this point, I will uh, close the opportunity for public comment uh, unless uh, if there is a, a lot of folks who still want to speak, then the council can discuss possibly continuing. Are, are there any others who would like to speak on this issue? We have, by the way, of course, received emails on the topic, and we've all read them. Okay. Uh, so moving on then to item number 102-2011. Uh, there was a request made uh, by uh, members of the council for reconsideration of item number 102. 
item 102-2011. And at this point, I would ask uh, for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to make a motion that we reconsider item number 102. 2011, and uh, presuming I get a second, I'd like to speak to my motion to explain why I think we should reconsider. Sure. Is there a second? Seconded. Yeah, the motion's been made and seconded. Uh, Councillor Swift-Piata. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I've done a lot of thinking about this. This is a little bit lengthy, but I think it's important to correct uh, or add to the record because I can tell from a number of emails and conversations I've had that uh, not everyone has all the facts, uh, let alone different interpretations of facts, but some, some of the information seems missing. So hopefully uh, this will add not to the confusion but to uh, some clarification. So let me begin my remarks by making sure that we all have a shared understanding of the central facts. During my 12 years on the council, I find that reasonable people in this town can usually agree on important matters once they know the actual facts. First, I want to be clear about what we're asking of the land trust. The path would be unpaved, approximately five feet wide. The surface material would consist of stone dust, a natural material. It would meander like a trail across a 1,400-foot route that would allow us to preserve a dozen large trees and reduce the need for blasting natural outcroppings of ledge. It would only cross into the huge Robinson Woods one acreage by an average of 15 feet and a maximum of 30 feet. In short, when you hear someone referring to the path as cutting through Robinson Woods, what they really mean is that it would cross along a sliver of its edge. It would have no meaningfully adverse impact on Robinson Woods as a whole, certainly much less than does the gravel road that already divides the two Robinson Wood parcels. But moving the path just 15 feet onto the edge of Robinson Woods uh, would make a big difference to the shore road path construction. I walked this route myself with a skilled planner, and I put red ribbons on the larger trees in the right of way that would be saved if the land trust were to grant our request. When you look at these trees, some of which have trunk, trunks up to three feet in diameter, keep in mind as well their substantial canopy that shades Shore Road. There has been some suggestion that moving the path would jeopardize the pathway itself. Suffice it to say, I am a strong supporter of the path, and if it should turn out that making the path a more desirable route somehow endangers funding or approval of the path, then we'd obviously have to rethink our approach at that time. But right now, though, there is little reason to think that we would necessarily encounter that difficulty. Next, uh, let's talk about the easement that Mr. Franklin mentioned. That's the easement that the land trust gave on the Robinson Woods One parcel to the Main Coast Heritage Trust in 2002. If the easement really did preclude the land trust from agreeing to our request, then that would be that. And there would be nothing to talk about. So we should all be clear about this. The easement certainly would allow the land trust to agree to our request if they wanted to do so. I have obtained and read the easement myself, shown it to some very good lawyers, and discussed it with our town council chair, who also happens to be a lawyer. They all agree with me that the easement certainly leaves room for our path if the Land Trust Board wanted to allow the path. Even the Land Trust Management itself has backtracked from earlier comments that the easement precludes the path. And to our knowledge, Main Coast Heritage Trust has not raised any objection to having an unpaved path. According to the Land Trust's executive director, he has not even contacted Main Coast Heritage Trust since 2008. The easement actually comes right out and states that it allows the construction of unpaved trails for walking and bike riding, that it even allows the construction of boardwalks, and that its aim is one of balance. Balance. Those of you who know me know that balance is a concept that I like very much. In fact, maintaining a balance between services and costs in our town is expressly listed as one of the fundamental goals of our comprehensive plan. 
The fact that the easement allows the path also tells us that the conservationists who think a lot about these matters foresaw a compatibility between public access and open space. Why spend large amounts of taxpayer money on preserving open space if we are to be hesitant to encourage our own citizens to enjoy that space? This community path along the very edge of Robinson Woods 1 would allow more Cape Elizabeth citizens to enjoy the balance we have preserved in our town between the requirements of life built around cars and the beauty of a place like Robinson Woods, which invites us to leave our paved thoroughfares and walk among the trees. Let me next briefly talk about this notion, notion of linkage that uh, Mr. Darling brought up. I am perfectly comfortable saying to the land trust that if they want $350,000 to buy more land to hold in trust, then they need to demonstrate that they exercise their discretion in a way that balances the town's legitimate needs. Seven councillors unanimously made a respectful request that the land trust give more weight to the town's compatible needs. We then learned that the heads of the land trust did not even call a board meeting, did not invite us to speak to their full board, and continued to rely on a flawed claim that the easement tied their hands. On such a record, in my opinion, it is responsible stewardship for the council to now formally link our requests and needs to their requests and needs. The land trust is asking for $350,000. We should ask, in return, for the land trust to help with saving the town $100,000. After all, linkage is just another name for a two-way street. I am particularly comfortable making this linkage, like Mr. Downs, uh, because spending $350,000 of taxpayer money on Robinson Woods II is a close call itself. And I say this as the only present councillor who was here in 2002 to support the acquisition of Robinson Woods I. Robinson Woods I was a major and significant acquisition because it took spectacular open space that could have been developed and saved it from development. This new parcel, which we've been calling Robinson Woods II, is a different story. The large majority of its land is already subject to essentially complete restrictions on development because of the presence of wetlands and the 250-foot wetlands zoning buffer. Out of the 60-plus acres, only several small isolated sections could secure a permit for a house and even then the process could be problematic. The point here is that most of this space will remain undeveloped whether or not the land trust buys it. And I am not the only person who sees this point. I traveled two weeks ago to Augusta to attend a meeting of a Land for Maine's Future Committee. The land trust leadership had indicated that they were reasonably confident that the Land for Maine's Future would provide some substantial funding to acquire these additional 60 acres as it had supported the acquisition of Robinson Woods I. In fact, the Recommendations Committee of Land for Maine's Future has concluded that this second Robinson Woods acquisition does not have a high enough priority to warrant financial support over other competing projects. So spending this money on this particular acquisition is a close call. I am nevertheless in favor of it if we can find a win-win solution such as the Council has proposed. The town would improve the shore road path, preserve some major trees, and save between seventy-five dollars and $100,000. Just as importantly, we would do so in a manner that lets the public see how they will benefit from both the path and from our exp expenditures on open space. In short, while the Robinson Woods II purchase really does not add to open space, it nevertheless creates greater public access to open space and connects to other parcels in the Greenbelt. I therefore find it especially appropriate that if we are to fund an acquisition predicated on access and connectivity, we should pause when the land trust leadership tells us, as they have now told us, that keeping our citizens from walking and riding bikes on a path across the edge of Robinson Woods is their unyielding goal. Now, in some of my comments this evening, I have implied that our respectful request to the land trust could have been handled better by the land trust's leadership, by which I mean its executive director and several officers. 
I do not mean to be critical of the individual board members, all of whom have contributed significantly to this community, and all, and all of whom are getting the same pay for their work that we counselors are getting, nothing. Indeed, part of my concern here is that when a unanimous town council, made up of many strong land trust supporters, went to the extent of making a formal and respectful request aimed at saving the town close to $100,000. No one at the land trust made sure that the whole board was called together, nor does it appear that there was a serious effort to find a way to address the town's very fair request. Rather, it appears that leadership aimed from the outset to deny our request, sometimes even saying that the easement gave them no choice. As a result, I suspect that there are land trust board members listening this evening who have now heard facts that were not clearly presented to them before. I serve on several nonprofit boards. It, it is hard work. One of the hardest tasks faced by board members is to maintain balance. Many interest groups, no matter how worthy their cause, tend over time to become overly narrow and unduly dogmatic in their positions. They can forget how important it is to fashion threads that weave them into the wider fabric of a whole community and its many needs. In this case, a pristine and uncompromising vision of a few people apparently precludes a pastoral, stone dust path from encroaching barely on the edge of woods that the town itself helped buy. I respectfully disagree. Citizens who choose to leave their vehicles behind and stroll through our town on our new path should be invited into the edge of these woods, rather than shunned like interlopers who must be kept out of the woods because they might be on their way to someplace else. Robert Frost well recognized that our New England woods can most inspire contemplation precisely when we encounter them at their edge, on, their, on our way elsewhere, with miles to go before we sleep. As Frost's traveler paused midst easy wind and downy flake at the wood's edge, he saw the woods as lovely, dark, and deep. The land trust, I think, should welcome the chance to give our citizens the opportunity for a similar experience. For all of these reasons, the prior vote on item 102, which I joined, should now be reconsidered. In taking this position, I do not insist that the land trust accept our proposed pathway as is. I have talked about balance. I believe in compromise, like Mr. Barton said and like Mr. Moll said. In lieu of the prior motion, I will therefore ask simply that the $350,000 be contingent not on our ideal route that has been put forward already, but rather on a route that is acceptable as a mutual compromise with field location within the edge of the woods to be worked out by the professionals so as to reduce blasting and tree loss while also avoiding any more substantial encroachment than is reasonably necessary. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Anne. Would anybody else like to speak to this motion? Well, I'd, I'd like to uh, speak. I don't know whether I could follow such an eloquent speech. Thank you, <laughs> Councilor swift -Kayata. Um I think that um, I came to this, this conversation listening to citizens who brought to my attention some significant uh, discussions that took place back in 2009 and questions relative to the process that the CELT um, board took as they undertook the question from the Pathway Committee. And um, what I learned early on was this 1,400 linear foot section of Shore Road that would be a removal of 12 trees, blasting an estimated cost of somewhere around $96,000. Uh, that this particular request was made when there were some unanswered questions about the path. One of those questions was the width of the path. Another was the type of material that the path would, be, would consist of. And while um, we presented this very question back to CELT again this time through our respectful discussions, we've, we've gotten different answers depending upon who you talk to. Frustrating as that is to an elected official who's entrusted with the citizen's uh, best interest. We sat at a, at a council meeting um, in workshop on the 30th and we heard 
the history behind uh, the meetings that were held by CELT over a period of time and the deliberations that were taken by the CELT board and the consideration, full consideration given to the PATH committee, which is asking to put this path through Robinson 1. We were told by the person who explained the history or the minutes or the detail that they were surprised by this question of the process, completely taken by surprise. That individual, while we listened attentively and heard the story, was then asked about a 2009 letter written by a CELT board member, which effectively questioned the very questions that we were raising again this time. And those gaps in the information that has been shared with me as a counselor have given me rise to question, there must be something else going on here. I don't know what it is. I know a lot's changed in three years' time. We now know the path is five feet wide. We now know we'll have a gravel base and a two-inch um, stone dust top. We also understand that Robinson 2, at least it appears anyway, is under control by self. That's a change. I think that's why we're all here today, is because all these things have changed, and it's, it's moving in the direction, I think, that's good for everyone. But I have to tell you that in reading emails over the last several days, I've been a little disheartened by people questioning what we as elected officials, our trust with the citizens, the people who put us here, and the things that we have to do to make sure that we spend the citizens' dollars in responsible ways. I take that responsibility very seriously. Um, our job is to ask tough questions. It's to do the detail. It's to get our town manager to give us answers to tough questions and research that's required so that we can make a good decision and then what decision that we make is in the best interest of everyone in Cape Elizabeth, not just a special interest. <clears throat> I have a couple of slides that I had the, the town present, and I'd like to have if Michael could put those up to just put some context around what was originally presented to CELT in 2009 and contrast that and compare it to what I consider good discussions. We haven't yielded any results yet, but we've had respectful discussions and with no result. The first slide that you'll see up there, and if I could have the pointer, that would be great. It's right there. Uh, this is, uh, and, and many of you have probably already seen this before, but, um, but what you have here in, is uh, the original, this is the original plan, and in this blue box, you see the amount of land that we were going to take from Robinson one. The second slide, context, blue, we were proposing in the original path discussion of taking all this land here from Robinson 1. Further, in this save 1,400 linear foot section, we were going to take this piece and this piece. At our workshop on the 30th, we had some good discussion, we had some contentious discussion, and I think in most cases, good comes from differences of opinion and willingness to talk. This last proposal was presented, actually constructed last Wednesday and presented to the CELT, and this is what is on the table today. We've asked them just for context here, folks. Uh, this is where the parking area is and the new kiosk that was installed by CELT. And as you move up the path, we're asking for the ability to come inside here and save a couple of trees. Further up, we're asking again to just meander into the property and save additional trees. And again, right here, another meandering location. But if you just look at the sheer volume of what we're asking as a result of the workshop on the 30th, you can see that we're trying to find some middle ground. The last slide, I think, is the metrics. The numbers tell the story. In 2009, this was a 1,400 linear foot section of road that we were going to put a five foot path, 7,000 square feet of the 82 acres was going to be consumed 
in that request. We believe, rightly so, what we came up with on the 30th is obviously a far cry from that, but one that strikes the partnership that we keep hearing about. And again, I keep hearing about it, but I have yet to see anything that demonstrates true partnership. 175 linear feet is all that that slide is going to take. Five foot wide path, gravel, stone dust. And to some degree, even that material is up for discussion if a true partnership were to be agreed. 875 square feet of an 82 acre parcel. So some of what I've seen or, or read in the emails accusing the town council of going back on its original position and who are we to do that and we're losing faith in our council and all these sort of I call them the boogeyman theory. The fact of the matter is we're trying to make this work and when someone says to me that we can save $96,000 by sitting down and talking to CELT who is, an, is a, a fantastic organization that has done great things for this town and continues to do that. But to ask them to look at their easement and consider what I presented to you here a second or two ago is, is just unfathomable on my part. I understand that they have rights, they have signed on to stewardship for landowners. I understand all that. And they're concerned about their credibility with landowners. But I would suggest to you that if they found a flaw in an easement that they had written and signed, I can guarantee you that their board would have a full meeting with everyone in attendance and consider making a change. We don't see a flaw here. We see an opportunity. We see an opportunity to save the town $100,000. And I have to tell you, there are a lot of people in this town that, got, that are going to get new tax bills very shortly. And Mrs. Smith, who sits out there on Spurwink Road or Fowler Road, who's going to pay another $100 a month in taxes, is concerned about that $100,000, which is why we're asking, in the spirit of working together in a partnership, that we get some consideration and we get a board to fully look at the question. And if nothing else, make a phone call to the trust and ask for their opinion. So I have to tell you, I'm a person who believes I'm very pragmatic about this. It's a concern of mine. It's not popular. I mean, if you read these emails, those of you who haven't had the privilege, most of you out there, uh, it's not pretty. But you know, at the end of the day, we got elected to do a job. We got elected to take care of the Cape Elizabeth citizen. And I believe that if we can get CELT to face up to their responsibility and partnership with us as we proceed, we're going to get something great for the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. I have to tell you that, you know, Ian's speech was a heck of a lot more eloquent than mine, but I appreciate the time and energy and effort that everyone has put into this. We've been accused, I know I've been accused personally of bringing this up at the 11th hour. And I have to suggest again, as I stated and quoted in the paper, I don't care if it's one minute before the vote. If something new comes up, new information that needs to be considered, the citizens of Cape Elizabeth have elected the seven councillors to take care of business. And if we don't do that, I don't believe that we would be doing our job correctly. So I know that uh, in the process of bringing this up for consideration, there are some suggestions or suggestions can be made about a possible um, amendment or possible adjustment, if you will, to the original uh, proposal that was voted on in June. And again, in the spirit of trying to get this done, let's take the positive first. If CELT's willing to work with us, would we consider putting that $96,000 on the table and adding it to the 350 as an option. 
I know that they didn't get that second round of funding as planned, or at least they had hoped this might help in terms of the total acquisition. But then if we don't get this uh, cooperation and partnership that, that I would like to see us get, um, would we consider amending the 350 by 96000 or whatever it cost us to build that section of Shore Road? So they would net whatever, the 250 plus. Bottom line here is I'd like to get something done and I'd like CELT to cooperate with us, but I really believe in the best interest of the citizens of Cape Elizabeth that we need to do something about this section of Shore Road and the pathway. Thank you. Jim, just for clarification, the 96,000 is what would be the potential savings for right. place, and I'm not sure that the second, the more recent comp quote unquote compromised version would actually save anywhere close to that. But what your suggestion is, it would be a, yeah. whatever the savings the best, might be. The best case scenario, if we went back to the original plan and we put okay. our path through right. according to the original design or a modified design since then, okay. the 96,000 is a number. Okay. That's all. All right. Thank you. I, I just want to jump in. I know other members of the council will want to speak and I'm not going to give you my big speech now, but I just have to address a couple of things. I, <clears throat> I disagree with a lot of what both Councillor Sufkayata and uh, Walsh have said. I, however, do respect their goal, which is to try to achieve a win-win for the town. Uh, but the fact that the reason why citizens are upset, Jim, that or accusing the council of going back on its word is because that's exactly what's happened. Uh, we said in our motion last week, last month, very clearly uh, that this was not going to be a contingency. Uh, that we were going to make a respectful request, have a respectful discussion. That's indeed what has happened. But because some of the council don't like the apparent direction that's gone in, they've done a 180 degree about face. So I think that's why people are upset. That's frankly why I'm personally upset. But you know, you got to move on and, and have the discussion. Uh, the suggestion that CELT has acted somehow in bad faith, I, I you know, I. I, I feel like I've got to come to their defense. The board member who explained the process that they went through and who said that she was surprised by the concerns that had been raised by that process was, was, was talking about the letter that she and the other board members had received in April or May of 2009. She was surprised by that letter, not by this recent concern that people have been expressing because clearly that board member knew that there was somebody affiliated with CELT who was upset about the process. So I. I don't think there was anything disingenuous or inaccurate with the recitation of facts that that board member gave to the town council last week. Uh, uh, in, in any event, uh, we want to continue the respectful dialogue. It's hard to have that respectful dialogue when the council is changing its mind, going back, on my, in my view, on its word and saying, if you don't do this, if you don't have the respectful dialogue and agree with what we want, we're not going to give you the funding that we all approved 7-0 last month. I, you know, I'm willing to con continue the respectful dialogue. I think we need to continue that. And at no point in time did Ted Darling or Chris Franklin ever say to me, we're done. Uh, we're not going to go back to our board. We're not going to hold a special meeting. We, Mike McGovern and I met with them. We had what was a very cordial discussion. I summarized that. It seemed to me that it wasn't going to be fruitful to continue the dialogue. That was my perception, but they at no point ever said, we're not going to continue the dialogue. Uh, we had a workshop the other week, and I spoke with Ted Darling on the phone very recently. They will continue the dialogue. They will continue to address uh, the compromise plan. What they don't want to do is have a gun held to their head, uh, and I can appreciate that. But uh, uh, in any event, would anybody else in the council like to speak? Frank. Well, you've stolen the mo most of my thunder, Dave, but uh, let me just make a couple of points. I think the, for me, uh, we are elected to, make, to do the town's work and to make decisions, and we did that last month. After uh, a lot of conversations and several meetings, at least, we concluded as a council 7-0 that we would approve the funding of Robinson Woods II, uh, contingent on not uh, changing the terms of the path, but a dialogue regarding um, the path. That occurred. Uh, there is nothing, no new information that we have in our hands today which should cause us to change that point of view. There's no new facts. Uh, there's nothing. Uh, 
the, the situation is exactly the same today as it was last month. Um, and I also, um, sort of echoing what you're saying, Dave, um, to, to suggest that some some fashion, self leadership approach this with lack of sincerity uh, and lack of integrity, I think is both inappropriate and incorrect. Um, I'm very comfortable with uh, what we've heard from CELT in terms of the conversation. It is not the town council's role to interpret conservation restrictions. That's CELT's role. Um, there is no reason for us to be doing that. Uh, not only reason, no basis for us to be doing that. Uh, the bottom line here is that uh, one could debate whether or not uh, the town should be funding $350,000. Uh, that debate occurred last month. I happen to agree that we should. That's not up for debate at this point. Uh, we could also be debating the easement if one wanted to, but that's in the, that's in the um, hands of the uh, of cell. So um, I will not be supporting this motion, and I don't see a basis for uh, doing that. Thank you. Uh, Caitlin? One of the joys of speaking towards the end is I can just say I agree a lot with what Dave said and a lot with what Frank said. Um, being part of a family that has an easement with the land trust, I greatly respect what they are saying, that they are honoring what was put before them when they signed the easement with the trust. And while, yes, there seems to be some wiggle room, as we like to call it in this easement, and what could be interpreted, I hope that if in 50 years somebody was to find some wiggle room in the easements that are held on either Jordan Farm or on my own parents' farm, that the CELT would stand up to them and say, that's not the intention that was put before us when we signed this easement, and we're going to hold firm to that. And so I commend them for holding firm to this, and I as well will not be supporting the reconsideration. Thank you. Jessica? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I've been a, a donor and supporter of the Land Trust and its um, goals, but I, and I do respect the efforts that they have been making. I do not, however, agree with their ultimate decision. Um, I do think it entirely proper and prudent to revisit um, this decision. We are, after all, spending a great deal of taxpayer money. And we are borrowing $200,000 of it. I'd like to uh, mention that since 1990, the town of Cape Elizabeth has given the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust $715,000. I would also like to point out that in 2009, the town of Cape Elizabeth received $25,000 from the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. So partnership has happened and is possible and is ongoing. I would hope that it would continue. I think that I'd, li I'd like to point out that uh, I disagree a point of information with uh, Councillor Governale because I believe that when he stated that the, the, it is not the business of the town to interpret the easement that's correct, it's actually the easement holder's role, and that is the Maine Coast Heritage Trust. And to my knowledge, there is no interpretation of this easement on Robinson Woods 1. And although we have had discussions um, with the land trust as of late, I do recall vividly the comment of Mr. Gale, um, who was on the, uh, one of the directors, that he would not uh, recommend that the land trust consider any further compromise until and when the $350,000 is secure. So I was disappointed at that comment because I felt that was a stonewall. I do think that we have a wonderful opportunity for a win-win. I think especially in lieu of the economy, and I know I'm, I'm a broken record on this, but we just heard from Augusta that the school funding formula has been changed. And as a result of that, Cape Elizabeth's school department will be looking at an additional $200,000 deficit. And so this kind of money and what it does to our taxpayers is always on my mind. And here's an opportunity to save possibly $100,000 by, by partnering. I do think that it is appropriate for asking for something in return on this issue. I really do. And I would hope that we could go forward together in, in this matter. 
I think it's a win-win for everyone, and I think we have an opportunity to preserve not only Robinson Woods II, which I'm thrilled about that possibility, but also a piece of Shore Road. Uh, thank you, Jessica. I'll, I'll keep, well, I'll keep my, my final remarks brief, but I just wanted to highlight the comprehensive plan that was adopted by the town council before I became a member, but really is a blueprint for how we ought to be proceeding with our decisions. And all these green tabs are references to the goal of preserving open space and the natural beauty of the town of Cape Elizabeth. And I don't normally quote the first President Bush, but there is this vision thing uh, here. And the vision statement of the comprehensive plan uh, uh, says it beautifully. The vision represented by this comprehensive plan is to preserve Cape Elizabeth as a highly, highly desirable community in which to live by the following. Expanding open spaces and accessible trails. Encouraging the preservation of working farms. Continuing the current slow pace and pattern of development. Maintaining excellent educational and municipal services. Cultivating the town center as a mixed-use commercial area supporting the high levels of citizen involvement in town activities, and balancing services, services and costs. In the executive summary, the assets that are listed by the authors of the comprehensive plan, number one, open space and physical beauty. The challenges include preserving open space and respecting the rights of private property owners. Uh, opportunities are to partner with public and private entities. If you look at each specific goal in the comprehensive plan and then the action items that follow each goal, they are all in conformity with the vote that we took last June, which is to help the land trust, to partner with the land trust to preserve this open space. One council member just remarked, I don't see a true partnership here. Well, we have an organization that is coming to the town with an opportunity to preserve 60 plus acres of very important open space and they're saying if we contribute approximately a third of that purchase price they can make it happen. Unfortunately, CELT has a bigger challenge ahead of itself because of the Land for Maine Futures decision but we are helping this organization do something terrific for our town. To me that seems like a pretty good partnership. Uh, if you uh, look at some of the action items and I won't read through all of them, uh, Recreation and open space goals. Goal one, the amount of publicly accessible open space should be increased in order to preserve the current local standard of open space of 118 acres per 1,000 population. Among the implementation steps, number 51, purchase land or conservation easements when there is an opportunity to preserve unique or significant open space, especially where it can be added to the Greenbelt Trail system. This accomplishes that, that goal and that implementation step. Goal number 52, to partner with the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust, public and private organizations, state and federal agencies, private landowners, and other key stakeholders to preserve open space and trails permanently that define our rural community character. Uh, goal number 54, which CELT helps us on, to maintain a dialogue with major landowners regarding their future plans and discuss methods for, for preserving significant open space for recreation. Uh, to me, uh, we made the right decision last month. I'm going to vote, obviously, against this motion for reconsideration. And I look forward to continuing the dialogue with the Land Trust uh, and ask them and their board to consider the modified plan that uh, Councillor Walsh did explain uh, in chambers uh, a little while ago. At this point, I'd like to call the question. All those in favor of the motion to reconsideration? And those opposed? Okay, with a, a, a tie vote, uh, that means the motion does not carry. So that the, the motion that was approved at our June meeting uh, is the decision of the town council. And thank you, everybody, for coming out this evening. We do have more agenda items. so. Uh, if you don't want to stick around, we certainly understand, but if you could clear out relatively quickly, we can move on. Uh, I, 
Excuse me, we, we do need to move on. <laughs> yeah. Sincerity. Not that you wouldn't hear otherwise. Also, uh, it's quite warm in here. Okay, item number 111 2011. This is the Astor Lane and Cottage Brook Phase 1A acceptance. Phase 1A of the Cottage Brook subdivision is now ready for acceptance. This includes a portion of Astor Lane and related open space. It is recommended that the acceptance be conditional upon deeds acceptable to the town attorney for both the open space and the road and upon the installation of a light pole for the plans and receipt of the as-built drawings. Um, would anybody like any further background from the town manager on this? Is there a motion? Jim. Move that we accept Astor Lane and Cottage Brook Phase 1A, item number 111, 2011. Second. Oh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Motion's been <laughs> right, made and seconded by Councillor Sullivan. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, item 112 2011. Uh, this is the Open Space Management Committee deadline extension. Uh, who, uh, Jessica, would you like to just give a brief summary? Yes, certainly. Yes. Um, we have our, our document is, is in its final stage and ready. Um, however, uh, the town manager noted an issue, uh, a potential issue, with some of the names that we had given to parcels in town. And this was a, a recent uh, uh, discovery on, on Mike McGovern's part. Therefore, um, we felt it prudent to wait until the full committee co convenes, which is tomorrow, <laughs> and so that we can review this um, and then uh, we, so we'd like an extension to September. I mean, the document's done. It's just how do we uh, review Mike's concerns and uh, make the appropriate changes? Uh, would, with that background, Jessica, would you like to make a motion then? Yes. Um, I move that we accept the uh, Open Space Management Committee's request for deadline extension to September 30, 2011. Thank you. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion or questions? I uh, just want to thank you and your committee for all your hard work on this issue. All those in favor of the motion? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Item 113-2011, the website video opportunity. Uh, we have some materials in our packet for tonight. Uh, Mike, would you be willing to give a brief uh, summary of this? Many towns have uh, used a, an opportunity that was developed uh, and endorsed by the National League of Cities and the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Uh, to have a company called CGI come in and at no cost to the town do a series of videos adding up to about five minutes that you, you indicate the areas that you want them to film, you work together on script development, and it's all paid for by advertising sponsorships who are in the frame around the videos. And looking at Freeport and Yarmouth and other, a few of the other places that have done this, it looks like a nice way to, to highlight some of the more entrepreneurial activities of our community and to, uh, you know, sort of introduce people to our schools and our open space and uh, perhaps uh, uh, gift shops and churches. Uh, when I say church, I mean Spurling Church uh, as a way of promoting the use of that. Okay. Frank? Do we have any editorial privileges? We do, totally. Okay. And the question, Jessica? Yeah, I have not viewed the Yarmouth or Freeports. I just, uh, the only concern I have is that um, the um, sort of pristine um, image that our website has not be too clouded with, with uh, advertising and, and that, that what exists, I understand how all this works, but that what it is is subtle and um, tasteful. I think that's a, a good, well, and that would lead to the question I had, um, which is the, the advertising, would, would that appear on the videos or where would, where, where would the advertisements appear? On the, the, the home page would be just a little box that said, link to videos of Cape Elizabeth. And then you press that link and then it, then it goes to another site operated by, I think, operated by CGI that actually has the videos 
that and then the advertising appears in the frame. So it's, I understand the concern. And one reason why I think, th I thought three years, give it a try. You know, maybe in three years we might have the capability to do, do it on our own. But for a three year period, I didn't think it was, I thought it was a nice experiment to try. And what would the types of videos be? You know, yeah, through you. Yeah, no, please go ahead. Yeah, usually they do a welcome video. I, I see that we'd probably have one done by the school department that gives a brief explanation of the schools. I see one uh, that might talk about the community's open space. I see one that might be specifically about uh, the Spurwing Church as a, as a venue for different opportunities. It was in tying in with the council goals. I would really look direction to the council goals, the things you wanted to do and emphasize, and which, which of those things might be suitable for videos. And, you know, we would not do one that's pro-property development, some of those things that, that, you know, I just get the sense wouldn't be warmly received by everyone. And in terms of approval of sponsors, we have some discretion there as well? We would have veto power. Any further questions? Uh, Frank. Maybe mention this, Mike, but the, when it goes to the link to the other site, is it clearly not a Cape Elizabeth site, or is it sort of patterned after our homes? Our, our no, homes? The, the ones I've seen weren't. They, it sort of it comes up in a separate little window, okay. uh, you know, like a frame. Right. And on that frame, it's, it's just the video, and it's these little ads. Okay. And, and the, all the ads are hypertext links, which then would go right. to, you know, my guess is a real estate company, uh, sure. maybe a doc, dentist's office. Uh, you know, those types of places would probably want ads. Maybe the land trust might want one. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And yet, the arrangements and the ads would be solely between these companies and uh, and CGI, the company. Although we would do a letter of saying we've endorsed this. Any other questions? All right. All those in favor? Wait. Do we have a motion? Do we have a motion? I don't believe we have a motion. Would anybody like to make a motion? Jessica. I move that we uh, authorize the town manager to accept the website video opportunity for a period not to exceed three years. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Well, Go ahead, Caitlin. Do we then, if we want it to continue in three years, have a new vote? I mean, when you say to not exceed three years, are we limiting it to... It could be great and successful in three years we have to stop. I'd be willing to amend the wording to include for an initial period of three years. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the draft contract provides that we would need to give them so many months notice before the end of the three year period or it automatically renews. So I, I think it is something we ought to put on the calendar. And you know, I look at it, you know, the council right now technically we don't allow advertising on our website. Right. And you know, maybe at some point the council may want to overall change that policy. And that's you know one reason why I thought three years was good because I didn't see that happening in three years. But I didn't see it happen in a year or two. But a, you know a council here in three years might want to do that. Are we precluded from having advertising that sort of competes with this? No, nope. no. Nope. So, okay. all right. Uh, the motion that you made and amended. Did this person who seconded it accept that amendment? Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. All those in favor of the motion? It carries. Thank you. Item 114-2011, a pole location permit on Spurwink Avenue as part of the upgrade now occurring at the Spurwink Treatment Plant. The Portland Water District has been working with Fairpoint Communications on a new location for utility pole. Uh, is there any additional background you think may be helpful, Mike? Yeah, th there was a map included. I just want to be sure that everyone understands it's on the, the inland side of the road on the treatment plant and not on what's thought of as the town farm side of the road. You know, the, the less offensive place. So we no need blasting. <laughs> Any, do we have a motion then to approve? Move to approve. Thank you. Is there a second? Seconded. All right, thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? It carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, what I would suggest we do now uh, is I think I, I don't actually have the amended uh, uh, agenda in front of me is item 116, the That's driveway. 116 now. The amended agenda has. Thank you. So item 115 is uh, for consideration of an easement. Uh, if you all recall, this related to the uh, driveway permit appeal in the Stonegate neighborhood. Uh, and this is an easement, I understand, 
that uh, will help facilitate a closing on the sale of that property. Thank you. Uh, so Early Bird LLC is requesting an easement deed to allow a portion of the driveway at 374 Mitchell Road to extend out to the right of way of Stonegate Road. Uh, this is a lot that once had a driveway extending to Stonegate Road and was the subject of litigation earlier this year. The parties of the litigation involving the first driveway permit have indicated approval of the town granting the requested easement. And we did get in our materials a proposed easement as well as a diagram showing its location. Uh, just preliminarily, when we dis considered this issue, I believe it was last December or November, we had some members of the council who recused themselves, but my understanding is uh, we don't have the same issues today that we did back then. So is everybody prepared to consider this request? My conflict has disappeared. All right. so. Thank you. And it's, not a, it's not part of some gate anymore. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, is there a motion then? Jim? I move that uh, we accept the... Um, 374 Mitchell Road driveway easement request, item number 115. I'll second. Thank you. <clears throat> Any further discussion? Just, Jessica. Yeah, I just had two questions. Um, I want, I, it occurred to me as I read through this, should there be language uh, stating that there would be no structure uh, permitted? And that was my first question. My second question you, is... You mean other than the driveway? Other than the driveway, right. And my second question is, is, the, is this the final language of the deed? Yeah. Yeah, if the town manager would address yeah, your question. We, we, the applicant that was looking for us to grant the easement deed gave us some language. I sent it to Tom Leahy, uh, the town attorney. He revised it. And the easement deed, as it's now drafted, would allow the owner of this property to construct and maintain a portion of the driveway originally constructed to access Stonegate Road, which was relocated to provide access to Mitchell Road, which is which encroaches upon the property as it had as shown in Schedule A. It's the only thing it allows is to construct and maintain the portion of the driveway okay. shown in Schedule A. Yep. Okay. So that would preclude. I, I mean, I think this is fine. It just occurred to me. Yep. What do you say to say? Well, make sure this is just a driveway and not a building or whatever. That's all. Okay. We're not going out counting the flowers planted or anything, but that's, the, that's what the language of the easement has. Jim. Just a question, David. Um, it's a Class D survey, and on the survey, it actually shows the driveway um, actually being built into the easement area. It, it currently doesn't exist that way. I guess my question, I, I'm, not, I'm a little confused by that. Because the driveway is actually further into the property, and it... And, um, it actually squares off. There is no turnaround like there is what's shown on that Class D survey. So, Jim, you're saying that the driveway goes further into the town property? Yeah, or? the way this is designed here on this Class D survey, mm -hmm. it shows it on the town property, and I don't believe it's, it's actually squared off. That driveway is, is just a, a left angle coming off Mitchell Road into their garage. Doesn't have that turnaround that overlaps or comes out on our reason. Yeah, it's, you're, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, as you come in this new driveway off Mitchell Road, uh, as you actually, once you, when I, as you're coming out of the garage, as you come out of the garage, there's this little bend that comes out from the regular driveway, so then you can go straight out to Mitchell, you know, head first. You, but it does allow you to back up to into this area and then out, and it does extend over but into our right of way. it's currently. That I believe that is, it's been paved, yeah, when I looked at it the other day. Yeah, the applicant's shaking his head affirmatively that it's been paved. Wow. Okay. So, so I'm not sure I understand the concern. I, I, no, it's the lot line. It's, it's really where this lot line is located. And, and just when you actually drive by, the owner developer has, a, has some kind of uh, marking for the edge of the lot or the edge of the, uh, edge of the installed um, Grass area. Why, Mr. Pillsbury, would you be willing to just come up and address the questions that might help clarify things? Um, it's uh, Grant Pillsbury. I'm half owner of Early Bird Group LLC. Are you talking about the orange string? Yeah. Yeah, that is the 35 foot setback that was discussed with Bob Malley Public Works, right. 
and the plantings can't go beyond the Stonegate Association that, plantings. That explains it. It's, it's, it's an interesting market, but now I understand why. Okay. It's 35 feet. We did that for marketing purposes. This this is pretty accurate. Yeah. Okay. Did you? Are no, you all set? I just what? No, my question has gone away. All right. Thank you. Any further questions or discussion? Um, and I apologize. We do have a motion on the table that's been seconded. Okay. All those in favor of the motion? The motion carries unanimously. I assume that the, the motion was to grant the easement. We weren't accepting it. We were actually, you know, I just want to make clear that we, we weren't receiving one. We were granting one. And the minutes will reflect that. Okay. Thank you. Um, before we get to the last item on tonight's agenda, item 116, which is a hardship abatement request, I'd like to use this opportunity uh, for citizens who would like to discuss items that are not on tonight's agenda. If anybody would like to come forward, we'd be happy to hear from you, but I see that the chambers have emptied. Uh, so we, we will move then to item 116-2011, hardship abatement requests. We, I, I guess, I oh, did, I'm sorry. I was supposed to mention something at the beginning of the meeting, which I did. Uh, the council had a workshop this past month with the, the Arboretum at Fort Williams Park. And part of that discussion was is that they, they needed to go to the planning board for a review it and also the council. You did have that discussion at the council. They are planning to begin that work totally as discussed uh, by the council. They got a very accept very, very great bid uh, to do most of the groundwork and it appears to be well under control. So I just wanted to update you that, that everything's going fine and it's totally in keeping with your discussion at the at the uh, workshop. Okay, thank you. Um, getting back to item number 116, we handled these in executive sessions pursuant to Title 36 of the Maine Revised Statutes, Section 841-2G. Uh, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So I second. All, right. All those in favor of the motion? We will then adjourn into executive session. Thank you. Going to my office, the auditors are occupied that way.